Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the Life of Christ. We are in book number three, and today's lesson is going to be lesson number nine. Lesson number nine in your book is on page number 59. Lesson number nine, page number 59. So glad to have each and every one of you in class today. And I've been looking forward to today's lessons because we are going to talk about uh, the differences and compare the differences between earthly things and heavenly things, material things and eternal things. We are going to have a great time of discussion today. And But before we do that, as far as review, I always like to review as a reminder of the things that we've discussed. And there's a reason that I do that, because as we go through our review, it brings back to our mind some of the key points from our lessons that we covered, which just helps us to co cultivate the things that we've learned, place them in our mind so that we can get refreshers on them. And then I promise you the things that you hear, the things you repeat, when God is ready for you to use those things, they will come back to you in your mind. The things, now we know we believe in the supernatural and God does give a word of wisdom, God does give a word of knowledge, but generally, the things that we speak while we're teaching, preaching, and being used of God are things that we have read and studied and committed to our mind and our heart. And then out of the flow of the Spirit, those things which we have heard and learned and committed ourselves to will be used of God to flow out. Now, again, we do believe in the supernatural, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, but God generally uses the things that we place in our heart for ministry. And so as far as review in book number three, we've covered the first one was on the Sermon on the Mount as we all strive to live a life of discipleship and that discipleship and our lives of moral law is now found in the Sermon on the Mount. Very, very powerful lesson. One of my very favorite things to study. And then lesson number two, three, and four was a three-part series on parables and you know a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. We do not base doctrines or build doctrines off of parables, but we do build doctrine off of Scripture. And the story, the parable, points to the Scripture that then builds the doctrine. And then in lesson number five, we talked about salvation. Now, this lesson is very important because it does not just deal with the book of Acts forward. It deals with the concepts of the new birth of repentance, baptism, and infilling of the Spirit, that new birth experience, it uses that not just in uh, the context of the book of Acts forward, but it reveals it as something that Jesus teaches himself in the New Testament. Very powerful. And so when many times when we begin to talk about New Testament salvation, we deal with those things in the book of Acts forward. And then people will ask, many times. Well, what did Jesus say about all of that? Well, that lesson, lesson number five, covers the things that Jesus said about salvation. And he pointed to the very fulfillment of those things in the upper room in, on the day of Pentecost. And then lesson number six, the church and her future. Lesson seven, we talked about the kingdom of God. Lesson number eight, we talked about the law how that the Lord did not come to do away with the law, but he come to fulfill the law. And so now we are getting into lesson number nine. We are going to talk about material and spiritual values. Material and spiritual values. Page number 59. Page number 59. Before we get into our lesson, let's do as we always do, and let's go to prayer. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all that you're doing. God, I pray that you reach down and help us, touch us. We need your spirit to move. And God, I pray that you would work in our hearts, forgive us of all of our sins, cleanse us, help us, Lord, to be what you have called us to be. I pray, God, that we would be able to accomplish your will today. In your great and mighty name we pray, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for uh, being in class, and thank you so much for joining us in prayer today. And I'm looking forward to God doing some great things. So today in lesson number nine on page 59, 
we're going to be discussing material and spiritual values. In other words, we're going to talk about the earthly and the heavenly. We're going to talk about the temporal or the temporary and the eternal, and we will weigh the value of those things according to the Word of God. Now, the value of something is going to be based upon how long it lasts. The value of anything eternal will always be greater than anything temporary. And we know that the Word of the Lord tells us that the, even the sins of this world, the pleasures of this world, uh, they are temporary. They are here for a little while and then they are gone. So he even teaches us that there are some worldly things that are pleasurable, but they do not last forever. And because they do not last forever, they do not hold eternal value. It is the things that we do for God. It is following the things that God has called us to. It's following uh, the very direction of God, realizing and understanding that our lives are directly linked to the call of God. We were not born by accident. We are not here by accident. Our calling, our purpose in life. It may be that you're called to be a youth leader. It may be that you're called to lead a choir. It may be that you are called to be a wonderful saint setting uh, in a church, helping, doing the things that God has called you to do. And because of that, you find eternal value. That's why that Paul could say, if we had hope in this world alone, we would be of all men most miserable. We do not hope in this world alone because we know that our existence is with purpose. If we are here, it is because God ordained us to be here. That is a reason behind our existence. And because of that, we now know that we do not deal only with earthly things or temporary things, but we deal with eternal things and spiritual things. All through our lives, all through our ministries, we will have to weigh whether something is worth it or not based on its value, based on whether or not it has eternal value or whether it holds a, a, an earthly or a temporary value. And because of that, now we have the guidelines for what is um, most valuable in our lives. We can look at those things and determine those things based upon whether it goes away or whether it lasts forever, eternal things. So it's important that we lay the proper foundation for our lesson and we understand that when we talk about material things or earthly things, uh, the things that we have, even money, those things are not inherently wrong. They are not wrong. It's not a sin to have money. We know that the Bible tells us that money is the root of all evil, and it's really not money that is evil, but it is the nature of man that is evil. And because of our fallen nature, we have values and uses of money that become wrong. And so seeking after those things becomes in a, in not in itself wrong to have money, but it is in the way that we get it and how that we use it that becomes wrong. So material things in this life, God did not call us uh, to all just simply be poor. That's not a biblical. It's a uh, not a heaven or hell issue to have money or not have money. The heaven or hell issue or the eternal issue is what we do with what we have and how that we have it. And so uh, we need to understand that having money does not make you more one evil uh, any more than being poor makes one holy. Being poor does not make you holy. Being rich does not make you evil, but it is the intent of the heart and how you use or do not use what you have. That is what uh, determines it. So one of my guides, my personal guide uh, that I always live by is this. Am I willing to let it go? Am I willing to let it go? If I own something, if I possess something that I am not willing to let go of, then I know that that has a hold of me instead of me holding it. And so I look at those things and I, I, I see if someone blesses me um, with money, if someone blesses me with, with something, um, you know, anything, whatever possession it might be. If I am unwilling to let it go, if God asks for it, then that is something that is becoming more valuable than my spiritual 
uh, uh, existence than my spiritual being. And so I have to watch that. And if I find myself in a place where uh, I've, I've had times that someone blessed me with money, and then when someone would bless me with money, then God would open up a need and I would see the need. And the moment that that I check myself is when I know there's a need and I have the ability to help the need, but then something in my flesh doesn't want to help the need. It's not that I don't want to help, but sometimes we find security in the money. And so we go, I didn't have this. I'm secure with this and I'm going to hold on to this. Remember, there's nothing wrong with having the money. There's nothing wrong with having a savings account. There's nothing wrong with having a bank account with money in it. But when we do not want to let go of it, when God asks for it, then that is the litmus test for spirituality. I don't want to possess anything that I'm not willing for God to ask of me. Now, I know that's not always easy. I know that. Um, if, if you've lived your life and had very little, and then all of a sudden you work hard and you're blessed and you have some money in the bank, maybe it's not a lot of money, but your bills are paid and you feel secure in that, you feel comfortable, and then God says, give that money to, to the kingdom. Help this need. Bless this need. There, there is this feeling inside of all of us that loves the security of, of life. And nothing wrong with having that, but if I am unwilling to let it go, then I have allowed money or possessions, which are temporary, they are earthly because you cannot take them to heaven with you. I have allowed those earthly things to become more valuable in my life than heavenly things. I can't let that be. Not just as a preacher, but as a disciple. As a child of God, I cannot let that be. I have got to be willing, and especially when it hurts, especially when it emotionally hurts, when I don't want to let go, I've got to be willing to let go of those things. And that is the test for me. If it is something that I do not want to let go of, then I know that I am allowing something temporary to take on an eternal value. And if I do that, I'll be lost. And I don't want to be lost. Jesus taught the value of eternal things. Eternal things are always more valuable than earthly things. You could have all the money in the world. You could inherit all the world, but lose your soul. And what value would you have really had in this world? The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Luke chapter number 12 and verse 20 through 21. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. You can be rich toward God and poor in the eyes of man. You can have no pesos, no dollars. You can have no currency in your pocket, no money in your bank, and be poor among men. But if you are filled with his spirit and you are living for him, called and working for him, then you are rich among the things of God. When God looks down at you, he does not see a spiritually poor pauper. What he sees is someone that is spiritually rich in the kingdom of God because we serve a God that owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And in the moment of our need, he begins to show us that he and he alone is our eternal supply. God is trying to teach us to put first things first. God is trying to teach us that his ways are more valuable than the ways of the world. In the parable of the rich farmer, Jesus clearly taught the value of eternal uh, things compared to temporary possessions. In Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 15, we read, For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. God calls a man a fool if he lays up treasures in this world only. Now notice that's a key word there. In this world only. He does not call a man that lays up and provides a fool. Matter of fact, you're a fool if you don't provide for your family. And uh, matter of fact, that's very important. And we may need to get into that at a, at a different time. But we are required by the Bible to provide for our 
family. So you're a fool if you lay up for treasure in this world only. You must lay up not only for this world, but you may lay up most importantly for the world that is to come. The most important thing is to be rich toward God. Now, noting here again, there's nothing wrong with preparing for your future here. It's absolutely biblical, doctrinal, to provide for your family here. It is my responsibility as a husband to provide for my wife, as a father to provide for my children. It is my responsibility to do that. Just as much as it is my responsibility to teach them the ways of the kingdom of God and be the priest of my home, it is my responsibility to provide financially from my home. And as I do that, according to the work of God, the plan of God, God then makes up the difference. Why? Because I put him first. So I do not just provide for myself here, but I also provide for eternal things first and foremost. So nothing wrong with providing here but you must not provide here while neglecting providing for eternal things. There must be a balance. And if there's not a balance, it must heavily lean toward eternal things over the earthly. True value of anything can be established in its lasting and eternal qualities. That, that's important. That's probably going to be on a test. The true value of anything can be estimated by its lasting and eternal qualities. If it doesn't have eternal qualities, then if you have to have if you have to decide between investing in spiritual things or earthly things, heavenly things or, or earthly things, eternal things or temporary things, you better always choose the heavenly. If you have to choose between the two. Jesus instructed his disciples to put First things first. That's why Matthew 6.33 said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus taught and modeled the principle of kingdom first. The most valuable thing in the kingdom of God and is, is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Therefore, this should come first in a man's desires, and first in a man's ambitions. Jesus reminded his disciples that God fed the birds and clothed the flowers, and he would do the same for them. Give neither thought for the morrow, the food you'll eat, the clothes you'll wear. Why? Because God will provide. Jesus taught that our treasures should be in heaven. Matthew chapter number 6 tells us, Matthew 6 and verse number 19 tells us, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Verse 20 said, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That is an important thing to remember. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Treasures in the earth, earthly, temporary, temporal things, they are very much temporary. They rust away and they can be stolen by thieves. There is nothing permanent about treasures or possessions of this world. You cannot take them to the next with you. Many people have laid up treasures upon the earth believing that they were gaining security only to see them all go away and all disappear. How different it is with treasures laid up in heaven. These treasures that are laid up in heaven the things we do for God, the things we give into the kingdom, the way that we bless others every time we preach, every time we teach, every time we do evangelism, every time we lead a Bible study, a choir, any time that we do anything for God, our lives living for God, we are laying up treasures in heaven that rust cannot corrode and that thieves cannot steal because the Bible said that heaven is a place that has open gates why? Because there is no thief that you have to worry about entering into that place to steal the eternal things that we have done for God. They cannot be corrupted. They cannot be stolen. They are completely secure in the things of God. 
page number 60, whatever a man may consider most valuable in his life will be where his treasure is. Now, the writer says three things. This is very important. He said that, that we must, upon this idea, this concept of where our treasure is, that's where our heart is, upon this he will devote most of his attention, time, and energy to the things that he has placed his heart are most important in his heart. So I asked the question, and I wrote it down in the top of my notes. You want to know, where, where is your heart? Where is my heart? And so I wrote it down. Where do I give my most attention to? My most time to? Where do I place my most energy at? Because that is the telltale sign of where our heart is. Now, I want first things to be first because I know that I want the things of God to, that are eternal to work in my life and to be first in my life. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we applying most of our attention to, most of our time to, and most of our energy to? Because that will reveal our heart. Jesus taught that riches are deceitful. Now, that's a very strange word, and I'm not sure exactly how it translates um, in, in Tagalog. I'm not sure exactly how it translates in whatever dialect your, uh, your, your language, your, your first language is. Uh, but in the King James text, that word is very, very powerful because in Mark chapter number 4 and verse number 19, he said, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So we talked about the deceitfulness of riches. Now, it'd be interesting to know how that word translates in Tagalog because uh, in the King James English text, the word deceitfulness here in the original, when you look back at the original language that it was written in, is, is not just deceitfulness, but it means a delusional. It means deception. So in other words, riches are deceptive. They make you think you have security when you really don't have security. Riches are very deceptive uh, because they make you think that you have all of this ability to do whatever you want to do because you're very rich, but they are deceitful. They, they cause uh, deception. They cause delusion. You think you can and you think you have the ability, but you do not because riches that are gained in this world can be lost in this world. And your security. So I, I heard someone say one time, they said, well, I'm just thankful. I'm not rich, but I do have enough money in the bank that if my car breaks down, I don't have to worry about it. I can pay to get it fixed. And they can build up money and none. And there's nothing, remember, nothing wrong with that as long as your first priority is eternal things. God didn't call us to have to be poor, but God did call us to be spiritually humble and seek him first. And all these things will be added to us. Now, that person that could then afford to fix their car got enough money to where then they could afford to buy a new car if they wanted one. Then they got enough money to buy a new home if they wanted one. But then they got cancer. Then they got, the, the cancer was pancreatic cancer. And even though they had enough money to fix a car or enough money to then buy a car and then enough money to buy a home and then enough money to buy whatever home they wanted... When they got pancreatic cancer that was incurable, at the highest stages, they were willing to pay all the money they had, all the money that could have bought the cars and bought the homes and bought all the things that they ever wanted in this life. They could not afford to buy their health. And that person passed away of pancreatic cancer. And they would have given all of the money, all the riches of this world, to buy their health. But riches are delusional. Riches are deceptive. Because you think that I have no care because I can buy anything I want, but then you cannot buy health. You cannot buy happiness. You cannot buy a good marriage. The thing that brings happiness is eternal things when you place your trust in God. The things that bring us to a place of, of fulfillment and joy is not that we can buy whatever we want, but it's that we are serving the God that created us and we know that he 
alone is able to take what we do and make it eternal instead of putting our trust in temporary things. In the parable of the sower and the seed, state uh, of the parable of the sower, Jesus stated that some of the good seed was sown among thorns, which choked the seed so that it became unfruitful. Jesus named the thorns as being cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches or deception and delusion of riches, and lust for other things. So the deception of riches is that you find false security. When you steal, you could build a bigger barn and you find your sense of security. But if you are not basing your life in eternal things and you ultimately are deceived by those riches. How here Jesus described riches as being deceitful, the promise Many things, security, power, peace, and happiness, however, riches are unable to produce those things. They are completely disappointing. They are deceptive and they cause delusion. The rich young far or the rich farmer in Luke chapter number 12, verse number 20, the Bible said this, but God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Though he had security for his old age and happiness for his soul in the earth, but his wealth and his prosperity were unable to fulfill his expectations, they were wholly deceitful. You can fill your barns with the things of this world, but if you do not have the things of God, you are deceived. Security does not come in money alone. Security comes in the things of God. Jesus taught that riches are an obstacle to salvation. The Bible said in Matthew chapter number 19, verse number 24, And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Mark chapter number 10, verse 24 said, But Jesus answered again and said unto him, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? In the story of the rich young ruler, we find an imp several important truths. Number one, the rich young ruler wanted to know what he had to do in order to inherit eternal life. He was a morally clean and upright young man, but he knew that he was unsaved. His money did not save him. The Bible said that he was a rich, young ruler, and there are many theologians much smarter than me that believe that because he was so young and so rich that he inherited most of his wealth, and he had a Bible knowledge. He understood the law. He said, I haven't committed adultery. I haven't done any of these things. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord looked at him and said, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. And, and he went away sorrowful. Now, I want you to be, and, and think about this, and in closing to our class, I want this is very important, because I felt the Holy Ghost just kind of nudged this in me when we were studying. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had a lot, but he was unwilling to give what he had. Now, if you'll notice, it was the plan of the Lord to the Bible says he came to seek and save that which was lost. It was never the plan of Jesus for the rich young ruler to be lost. It was never the plan of God for him to walk away. This man made the decision on his own. And even though the Lord loved him and wanted him to be saved and wanted him to know how to have salvation, we find that that um, that it's that he, the Lord never compromised the cost. I'm getting ready to close and we're getting ready to pray. God is trying to let us know. There's two things very important here. Number one, if you are unwilling to get rid of it for the kingdom, then it has you instead of you having it. That's where money and possessions in this world, that's where we have to be very important. Do we own it or does it own us? Remember, that's my guide. I want to know if 
Do I own the possession or does the possession own me? For this rich young ruler, he was unwilling to give what he had. Uh, we don't even know for sure if the Lord would have made him completely go through with it. We know that he told Abraham, go sacrifice your son Isaac. And then when Isaac was ready to go through with it, the Lord said, now I know. Could it have been, and, and this is not doctrinal because we don't know, could it have been that the Lord was not really expecting the man to sell all that he had and give it to the poor, but he was looking for the willingness of the rich young ruler ruler to do so. We don't know, but that's something to consider. We know that God did that. Now the Lord manifests in the flesh. He could have just been checking the man's heart. Do you possess the riches or does the riches possess you? And this man went away very sorrowful. And even though the Lord wanted him to be saved, the Lord would not compromise the cost because the price must be paid. And the question is answered of material and spiritual values in simply asking us the question, do the things that we possess possess us or do we possess them? Because that will give us the answer to where our heart really is for God. Lord, help us in the close of class. God, help us to understand that there's nothing wrong with having earthly things, nothing wrong with material things, nothing wrong with having these possessions as long as they don't have us. And when you call us to give and you call us to give our lives or our money or our things to help other people, Lord, even though there are times that it, it, it affects us emotionally and we feel insecure with it, help us to do what we know is right. And when we give to you, you will bless us many, many, many times over. And you will give back to us way beyond what we could ever give. God bless you. Had a great time in class today. If you have any questions about the difference between measuring material things and eternal things and their values, material and spiritual values, please, as always, contact me and let me know. If I don't know the answer, I will do all I can to help you through it. Our next class going to be a really, really great class. Lesson number 10 of Life of Christ, book number three, is going to be the final destination of man. We're going to have a great time talking about that and laying a foundation about eternal things. God bless you. Looking forward to our next class.